Step right up. Ladies and gentlemen, come one, come all, and join me for a dazzling, magnificent, extraordinary new series as part of the Municipal Archives History Bites programming. This is Savannah Spectacles, an introduction to Savannah's circus history in three acts. Over the course of this series, which will be rolled out in three separate parts, I plan to bring you Act 1, which is today's programming, Savannah Gone Wild. Um, Act 2, the circus comes to town, the sights, sounds, and politics of Circus Day. And Act 3, entertainment beyond the big top. Before we launch into Act 1, though, I wanted to take a moment to introduce the audience to the basics of circus history in general and in our fair city. The modern idea of the circus originated in England in 1768 when Philip Astley began performing equestrian trick riding shows for audiences in a ring with a 42 foot diameter, which, by the way, is still the international standard for a circus ring. The ring allows for spectators to see a 360 degree continuous view of the performer and allowed for the performer to use centrifugal force to their advantage when attempting their stunts. By 1770, to keep his audiences entertained, Astley added acrobats, rope dancers, and jugglers interspersing their acts between his own equestrian displays. A few years later, he introduced a clown into the mix, and the rest was history. Though none of these acts were necessarily unique or unheard of on their own, combining them into a multidisciplinary program and performing them in a ring was. The first performance of circus in America took place in Philadelphia on April 3rd, 1793. Equestrian instructor turned performer John Bill Ricketts performed feats of horsemanship in front of an audience of over 800 spectators on opening night. Ricketts took his show on the road, literally, and moved on to New York City in July and then south for the winter to Charleston in November. Ricketts was soon joined by other enterprising showmen who took up the traveling circus life, and soon circuses were crisscrossing all over America. J. Purdy Brown introduced the tent to the traveling circus circuit in 1825, and it was widely adopted by the 1830s. Replacing the labor-intensive temporary wooden structures that shows would erect in each new town with a highly portable and durable alternative. Early shows traveled from town to town using the nation's waterways, usually via steamboat, or if they were brave, they might have moved over land. By the 1870s, though, showmen like P.T. Barnum innovated ways to move their shows by rail, and this is when circus popularity really, truly exploded. There was absolutely no town that was unreachable for the big top anymore. There have been well over a hundred organized circuses in American history, some with huge, big, recognizable names like Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, and others who have names that have largely been forgotten, but certainly all brought a sense of wonder and amazement to those who looked upon those 42 foot rings. The earliest instance that I have discovered of a circus or menagerie, which is a traveling animal exposition visiting Savannah, was in 1799 when an elephant was exhibited in Bright Square. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. In February of 1801, the first known circus to visit Savannah came um, to town. It was actually also the first circus to come to Georgia. The company was a well-known one from Charleston that consisted of an equestrian performer, Mr. Ricketts, who was likely Francis Ricketts, the brother of John Bill Ricketts, uh, William Langley, and a Mr. Johnson. Their show delighted audiences with grand displays of horsemanship, tumbling, and comedic clown skits. Shows big and small visited Savannah throughout the 19th century. Possibly the first circus in Savannah after the Civil War, came to town on November, in November of 1865. On November 15th, Stone, Roston, and Murray Circus performed a benefit for the Female Orphans Asylum and raised over $375. They erected their pavilion on the corner of Abercorn and Liberty Streets. The first time that either Ringling Brothers, Barnum, Barnum and Bailey shows, or any of their uh, combination thereof, played Savannah seems to have been in October of 1886 when the United Barnum and London show was exhibited for one day only. Barnum and Bailey first played in Savannah in 1890 and the Ringling Brothers show played in town for the first time in 1905. 
Where a circus decided to reside during the winter months when they weren't performing was a very important decision for the show itself. The performers needed space to rehearse, store their equipment, and house their animals in a hospitable environment. But it was also a big deal for the town where they stopped. Hosting a, a circus's winter quarters could be a huge financial benefit. It brought a huge influx of able-bodied people that were open to working, and it also brought people who would spend money. Savannah was home for the winter quarters of the Cells and Gray aggravated shows in the winter of 1900 and 1901. They set up their winter quarters in the, quote, old government hospital grounds, unquote, which I presume may be the Candler Hospital, and then they started referring to that vicinity as Championville. I will cover some of the other notable performances in Act 2 and 3, but to bring our timeline up to the present, the last time the famous Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey played in Savannah was 2013, and our most recent blockbuster circus to come to town was Cirque du Soleil, who played earlier this year in 2023. If it seems like I'm saying seems to be or that I have found or possibly a lot, it's because I've relied heavily on newspaper reporting and advertisements for this research. With, or when you couple abundant descriptive terms and a plethora of traveling shows with sort of the gaps in the record, missing newspapers and missing records from the circuses themselves, it's completely possible that I may have missed something in this reporting. And we simply can't cover everything. Tracing the history of popular entertainment in Savannah is an endeavor that's rich with possibility, and I can really only hope to scratch the surface with this series. So now that hopefully you are a little bit more familiar with the basics of circus history in general and in Savannah, it's time to embark on Act One, Savannah Gone Wild. In this segment, I plan to outline some of the notable animal exhibits and trends as they happened here in Savannah. I do want to emphasize that it's some because these performance types were so prolific, we would all be here all day if I tried to touch on them all. As a disclaimer, I certainly cannot condone the treatment of animals in circuses and traveling menageries throughout history, and this presentation does not attempt to do anything but situate show animals in their historical context. I hope that even though now we sort of know better than to treat animals the way they have been in the past, we can also appreciate the monumental importance that exposure to these animals might have had for audiences of their time. Though uh, we think of wild and exotic animals first when we think about the circus, the most common and often most popular performing animal is actually one of its most mundane. That's the horse. As I've mentioned, much of our mon uh, much of the very early circus history consisted of feats of acrobatics on horseback. Whereas exotic animals would eventually draw crowds for their foreignness, equestrian arts captivated audiences for the opposite reason. Just about every person living in Georgia at the turn of the 19th century would have been very well acquainted with horseback riding. Um, it would take a lot to impress them then when it came to the equestrian arts. Circus horses as physical specimens therefore needed to be of the utmost perfection to attract the interest of a spectator. One circus historian remarked that residents of Georgia, quote, admired the magnificent circus mounts the same way that today's automobile aficionados admire a sports car, end quote. Similarly, Performing equines had to display their utmost refinement in their training and their responsiveness, and their riders needed to showcase the most daring feats possible. Acts like somersaulting through hoops, jumping over flags and banners, and striking acrobatic poses in order to win over their crowd. And they were always pushing the envelope. And their advertisements, like those seen here, really emphasize the daring and the specialness of their equine acts. These equestrian performances were relatively simple to put on. The companies could travel from town to town fairly easily, and they could command a crowd and, frankly, make money. Um, and thus, equestrian circus troops were quite prolific in the South before the Civil War. In the 1890s, hippodrome racing was introduced and the circus into the circus repertoire, um, during which 
performers would race on horseback around the circus arena. Audiences would have been very familiar with the exhilaration of speeding around on horseback, and it would add an element of um, competition into the race that made it that much more exciting. Along with adding that energy and excitement to Circus Day, competitions helped increase the popularity of many circus performers. Uh, just like contemporary audiences might cheer for their favorite celebrity on a reality show, 19th century circus audiences would have cheered on performers who were celebrities in their own right, who had awed them with their fantastic feats only a short time before. The modern institution of the zoo did not come about in America until the Philadelphia Zoo was chartered in 1859. Before that, there was no permanent centralized place to view a curated version of the animal world in America. So cue the traveling menagerie and animal exhibition show. During the 18th and 19th century, enterprising showmen and business owners endeavored to entertain and educate the masses by traveling far and wide with fine exotic specimens. At a time when the morality of many forms of popular entertainment was called into question, menageries presented no such predicament. Visiting a menagerie was considered a cultured outing where you could be educated about the animal kingdom. Many advertisements and descriptions of traveling menageries strike a balance of attempting to inspire awe, provoke curiosity, enlighten their audience, and put their mind at ease about what they would be seeing. Elephants, of course, are one of the most iconic circus animals, uh, right up there with big cats and apes. Um, but elephants were not always one in one with circuses. Late 18th and early 19th century audiences experienced menageries and circuses as two separate entertainments. In Savannah, residents had the chance to see an elephant before they had seen a circus. The first elephant, possibly the first exotic animal that I've discovered being exhibited in Savannah was in 1799, when a purportedly seven-year-old, 17-foot-long, seven-foot-high, docile, noble beast was on display at Mr. Glasses, or adjoining the courthouse in Wright Square. Admission cost half a dollar, and spectators could visit her between sunrise and sunset from at least March 19th through April 9th. The next time an elephant came to town was about 10 years later, when a female elephant described as 10 years old, 15 feet long, and 8 feet tall was exhibited first in Wright Square before she was moved to be stabled in Market Square uh, to better accommodate her and her audience. This time, the elephant stayed from mid-October through late November. On this visit, the elephant on display knew tricks. She could stand and lay on command, and she could uncork a bottle and drink its contents. This elephant came to Savannah one more time in 1815. If you might have noticed that the descriptions between these two elephants differed a little bit, um, that has to do with some ambiguities in the historical record. The first elephant ever brought to America arrived in 1796. She was purchased by a Massachusetts merchant named J.C. Crown and Shield, and thus she is sometimes called the Crown and Shield Elephant. She was purchased for $450 and was imported from Calcutta, and she was estimated to be around two years old when she arrived. Her description tracks with that of the elephant on display in Savannah in 1799. Other than Savannah, she was displayed in New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, but shortly after her arrival, Crown and Shield remarked that, quote, we shall at first be obliged to keep it in the southern states until it becomes hardened to the climate, end quote. Therefore, even though she first came to Savannah about four years after her arrival in America, other southerners likely had unprecedented access to this new wonder. There is, like I said, some confusion in the historical record about whether or not a second elephant was imported to America around 1804, because suddenly a female elephant named Old Bet with a different physical description and a different age from the crown and shield elephant is written about in newspaper advertisements. Though no import records are known for a second elephant, two accounts of the elephant being displayed happened nearly simultaneously in New York and Charleston in 1806, leading circus historian Stuart Thayer to conclude that they were likely two elephants on the circuit at that time. By 1808, Old Bet is advertised as the only elephant on display in America, 
which thus implies the possibility that the crown and shield elephant had passed away if she was in fact a different animal at all. As is far too often the case in American circus history, Old Bet made a tragic end in 1816 when she was shot to death while traveling through Alfred, Maine. In 1817, Old Bet's proprietors purchased a replacement for their lucrative menagerie showpiece, an animal called Betty or Little Bet, and she shows up in Savannah for the first time in 1818. Other elephants were crisscrossing the eastern seaboard by the 1820s, including Columbus, Horatio, Flora, and Timor, some of whom inevitably made stops throughout the Low Country. The elephant Tipu Sultan has the distinction of being the first elephant to travel America in a menagerie with other beasts. He was brought to Savannah in the winter of 1831 through 1832 in the company of 50 other animals. The advertisements claim that just 50 cents one could see the tiger of Brazil, the camel of Arabia, and other exotic animals or less exotic animals like bears, pumas, porcupines, and guinea pigs. All of these beings were exhibited in the city market area at the corner of Barnard and Bay Lane. Simultaneously, another menagerie was in town, this one advertising a unicorn, or what we might call a rhinoceros which this ad claims is the first of its kind to be on display in America. <clears throat> Much like the elephants, there is some ambiguity about the truth to this statement, but we do know that the first two living rhinoceri were imported to this country in 1830. In the name of a splashy advertisement and as foreshadowing of the classic exaggerations of circus advertising to come, <coughs> I hope we can give them a pass and just enjoy thinking about how weird and delightful Savannah must have been in the winter of 1831 and 1832. If warm-blooded creatures weren't your thing, fret not. Nearby in Market Square, you could pay just 25 cents, a steal really, uh, to see an exhibit of anacondas from Java, boa constrictors of Ceylon, and for good measure, a cosmorama or a display of pictures from different parts of the world. And if we weren't already sort of pushing the boundaries of good taste here, there was also a head of a New Zealand chief on display. Now might be a good time to mention that more often than not, these types of displays firmly do not comply with our current standards for cultural sensitivity and sort of political correctness. Overall, before 1850, Savannians had the opportunity to be exposed to, now, Ready yourself here. Elephants, rhinos, lions, tigers, zebus, which is a type of cattle, condors, lynx, ostrich, llamas, cougars, panthers, pumas, bears, badgers, weasels, an ocelot, monkeys, wolves, mongoose, porcupine, camels, macaws, zebras, emus, baboons, anacondas, boa constrictors, and last but not least, the guinea pigs. In 1828, uh, J. Purdy Brown combined for the first time the acrobatic feats and amusements of the circus with the natural wonders of a menagerie. The first such combination show seems to have visited Savannah the same year, which is this one featuring the zebra and a baboon. Um, this combination proved to be a winning format as it provided entertainment for everyone. But as they grew in popularity, these shows also began blurring the lines between entertainment and education, where they started to train the animals to do quote unquote unnatural tricks or by emphasizing the danger that comes from their proximity, whether that danger is real or manufactured. Later in the 19th century, that blurring becomes very obvious in one particular anecdote. Uh, the Dan Costello Great Shows had an ongoing sort of bit or act where they threatened to release a live lion into the towns where they were visiting during their circus parade. And they made a show of the big cat trainer, Herr Lengel, letting a lion out of its cage and walking it on a leash or on top of its cage um, during the parade. When the show came to Savannah in 1866, the police chief barred the trainer from even removing the lion from its enclosure during the duration of its stay at all, despite protests from onlookers and the assurance that the act was completely safe. 
Most of the biggest names in circus show history included combined circus and menagerie shows, including Adam Forepaw shows, Sells Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, and of course, the Ringling Brothers shows, all of whom visited Savannah throughout the 19th and the 20th centuries. I'll go into more details about these mammoth shows in Act 2, but these definitely um, advertised their... These shows that advertise their menageries usually traveled with extensive collections of animals yet unseen by uh, their audiences. They would be displayed separately in their own tent. And as you can see, there's an exaggerated version of this in the John Robinson poster in the upper right hand corner here. Um, and in this era, even the cages and wagons that contained the menagerie animals were elaborate made in eye-catching shapes and colors, and were just as much a part of the entertainment as the animals themselves. By displaying them independently, this allowed circuses company, circus companies to entertain their audiences all day long and make them really feel like they were getting their money's worth. And they were also being sensitive to the varying prudishness of their customers, those who did not wish to be exposed to the worldly entertainment under the big top or exposed their children, could still experience the natural marvels that the circus brought to town. And this is where I will leave you for this presentation, to be continued in Act 2, where we will discuss Circus Day in Savannah.